Hi everybody, you're watching The Jackie Gray Show. Joining me today is an extremely special guest. She is Entertainment Tonight host with a long list of accomplishments, including among them two Emmys. She starred in The Bold and the Beautiful, as well as an extensive list of movies, including He's Just Not That Into You and Romantically Speaking. Did I get that right? He's Just Not That Into You. Yes. She's going to talk to us about her journey to finding the one. Her most recent accomplishment is getting married to Snapchat executive Jacob Andrea Carly. Did I say that right? Am I getting I nailed that? No one, no one can get that name right. Like literally I've gone from having a name that's very easy, Carly Steele, which is my real name, by the way, to, I go to hotels and stuff and they're like, Andrea, Andrea, <laughs> and I'm just like, mm-hmm, Carly Steele. <laughs> and then so much easier, right? <laughs> um, it's such a romantic name. Now, We're here to talk about International Women's Day and their topic is Choose to Challenge. So we're going to talk about your journey to finding the one because when people look at you, they see Carly Steele, this this glamorous celebrity who travels the world, who's an international jet setter, so who better to have on, right? Um, You know, your friends with, your best friends with Rebel Wilson, who, you know, everybody here in Australia absolutely adores. She's amazing. Um, And you hang out with, you know, Tom Cruise and George Clooney. These are just, you know, not everyday people. So when people look at you, they're like, okay, well, she must get proposals every day. But what was your journey like? What was it like finding yeah. one? Did you have to kiss some frogs along the way? I was, I think, what you would call a late bloomer. Um, I think I was very career focused. Like I was very focused on my exams at school. So I didn't really date a lot at school. And then I was very focused on my exams at university. Like I have a law degree and I worked really, really hard to do well um, and study law and and get a first. That's the sort of degree in in the UK. And I just really had like one guy, I think I dated the whole of university. And then before the exams, I stopped dating him because I thought it was a distraction. (laughs) And then I, you know, casually dated throughout my twenties. And it's really been since like thirties that I've, had more of a romantic life, I would say. And I definitely was very, very like, kind of knew what I wanted. Um, And a lot of people were like, don't be ridiculous. Like you need to settle, like, don't be so picky. Don't do this, don't do that. And and I had a couple of family friends who would give me really stern chats and they're like all about this. But I always felt like I'd rather be on my own and be happy than not be with someone who is enhancing my life. And I still maintain that. Like I've had the best, you know, best life, I've got the best girlfriends, best adventures. And it's, it is, um, you know, obviously having a life partner is just extraordinary and amazing. And it's been the best thing ever. But at the same time, it's better to be on your own than being a relationship that isn't enhancing your life or is causing like drama or stress. Definitely. You know, we always tell people if you're in a toxic relationship, it's better to be single and don't settle because the one is out there. And sometimes we have to go through potholes. What are some of the potholes that you had to go through and had to overcome? I think for me, it was more that I was just on my own so much because I never really, I didn't really put myself out there and like date a lot. Um, Jacob is one of my few, I can count on one hand, like relationships I've had in my life and I didn't really like I would hang out with people and looking back I guess some you could call it dates but until him he was the first guy I lived with um the first guy like I had like a long you know long term thing with and like I said everyone was kind of giving up on me and I don't like saying giving up because it's not like a relationship is an achievement because I don't see it as an achievement in the same way that other things you do in your life for achievement. I think a lock has a lot of, you know, to play in it. It's about meeting the right person at the right time. It's got to be the right time in their life and it's got to be the right time in your life. And so many things need to align for that to work out. So I think that it's, again, it's like people were giving up on me relationship wise, but it would have to be the special person. And then my God, he, I just feel so lucky to have him and he's amazing. But I do tell my girlfriends and like everyone said, I mean, I'm the example of the one that everyone felt was a hopeless case. <laughs> like, like, and I mean, hopeless, like people were like, people thought I was um, like secretly gay and not coming out of the closet. Cause I was dating that little. And I was like, listen, if I was gay, I'd have a super hot girlfriend and I'd be out there cause women are just so amazing. And in a lot of ways, easier to deal with than men. Um, but yeah, that was kind of, it was, it was funny, but in terms of potholes, I didn't answer your question. Um, 
Yeah, I think like dating in entertainment is really hard. Dating in LA is probably the worst. I would say dating in London and New York was a little better because it's more cosmopolitan. There's people from all different areas. Whereas in LA, the actors, a lot of them can be very flaky. And, you know, you they're obviously very good looking. Then, you, you know, if they ask you out, you're like, oh my God. And then you get your hopes up and then they'll flake or, or something will happen. And it's not what you think, or they're a bit weird. <laughs> and so, and That's so it's a me. lot of and disappointments. So I dated in LA as well for about 10 years between, you know, 25 and about 34, nine years. But um, you're so right. It's so flaky. It's so transient. People are constantly traveling at times, you know, if they're an actor, they're away for a few months and you're not seeing each other. You're just having this phone relationship and you're like, is this even real? And I love what you said about, you know, it's getting married is not an accomplishment. This isn't, you know, a period anymore where women are basing their success on a relationship. You focus on your career. We're going to come back to Jacob in your personal life. Let's take you back to when you were 20 and you moved from Scotland to New York to pursue a career with Vogue. What was that like? And what were the challenges of moving to a different country? Gosh, it was, it was, you know, looking back, I can't believe I did it. My whole family moved to the U S my dad is an architect and he had a job in New York, a big project he was doing and we had spent some time in New York as I was growing up from like 15 to 20, had an apartment there because my dad had projects there and go back and forth. But definitely working at Vogue was a big culture shock for me. I wasn't like, my mother is very stylish. She's got the incredible clothes and just can put things together in a very cool way. Like I was never, and I'm still not, a, the cool girl. And going into Vogue, I was assistant to the managing editor and I did a lot more like the, on the writing side and I got to write the little contributors bios and I was very good at doing captions so I do like captions for the shoe articles like witty kind of one-liners but the other girls in there I was slightly in awe of because they were all like beautiful and cool and in the social scene New York and on all the committees and very much what you sort of read about in the Devil Wears Prada and um, so yeah it's just from someone who'd spent most of their time studying it was definitely a big it was a big adjustment but I learned a lot and I met a lot of people and that definitely set me up for what was to come. Carly you are so far from not cool you are absolutely stunning and gorgeous and what I love about you most is this adventurous fun personality it's no wonder that you went from New York to being on TV what was the first role and how did it all come about? The day of the Met Gala in New York so I was in Vogue and I liked it, but it, it's a slower pace working for a magazine. Like it's only really busy for the week you deliver the issue. And then it's quite quiet. I think if you're in the fashion department going off in all the shoots, it was busier, but definitely in editorial, it was a little slower. And I remember watching um, like Fashion Police with Joan Rivers and E and all these shows. And I thought it was so cool. And I loved how Joan was just so honest and being from the UK, being Scottish, I really like that honesty. And I was like, I want to go in there and just be honest and not like fake. Like there's so many hosts that are so fake. And I was just like, I feel the audience, they can tell when people are being fake. And so I thought it's kind of an interesting combination of law and acting, hosting. Like you have to get information out of people. They don't necessarily want to give you, but instead of wearing a wig and a gown as you would as a barrister in, in London, um, you do it with like, lipstick and curls, which is actually harder sometimes. Absolutely. So the day of the Met Gala, I was getting my boss coffee for like the 10th time because that was what she was like subsisting on at the time. And Juliana from E was on the, in the queue to get coffee. And I was really shy. Like I wasn't at that point someone who would go up to people, which is ironic because then I, now my job, I cost people for a living. But <laughs> I was I talked to her and I was like, I really want to work at E, like it's my dream job. And she's like, well, where are you now? And I said, Vogue. And she's like, you want to leave and work at E? And I said, yeah. And she's like, remember this, you can't spell cheap without an E. <laughs> and I was like, okay, because they don't pay that much. So I was like, okay, well, she's real. She's being real. So she sent me up with an interview and I went and interviewed. I just took the, I think I said to Vogue, like I had the dentist appointment. I was off for literally one day. Like I went to LA and back and interviewed and, and they were like, can you use an Avid in like produce? And I was like, oh yes, yes, of course. So I started as a, um, a, like a low level, like producer at E doing fashion. 
And then one day someone wasn't available to do a junket and it was a Richard Gear, and they literally just needed a warm body in the chair. So I got sent because I was like the last one in at night, always working like long hours and did it. And it went really well. And he's so charming, Richard Gear. And I remember he was like, I love this girl. I love this girl. It was so nice because I was so nervous. I think I vomited in the loo at the Four Seasons. I was so nervous. And, and then I just started getting more and more there. And then I went to TV Guide Network and then did Clark Productions and the live award shows and then ended up at ET with a lot of hard work in between. Let's, let's be real. <laughs> well, let's be real. I mean, you know, people look at it and they're like, oh my gosh, Carly's like traveled to the Cannes Film Festival and all these places. But when you're doing, you know, three countries in one day, it's exhausting. Yeah. And you have to like look energetic. You have to look pretty. You have to put on that smile. You have to do your research and ask the right questions. What's that like? Um, the three countries in one day that I did with Tom, that was my first shoot with Tom and it was nuts, honestly, because I'd come from Cannes and then I, it was my first big assignment for Entertainment Tonight, the Cannes Film Festival. And that was crazy. And I remember I had food poisoning and I was the only, you're the only one there. So like, there's no replacement. I remember I would go in, do an interview, be sick, then go to the next hotel, do an interview, like, be sick. like it was so nuts. And then halfway through, it was Kim and Connie's wedding. And so I got pulled out of Cannes just because I happened to be over in Europe and they needed someone to go. I mean, it should have been their host, really. I mean, I just started, went and covered Kim and Connie's wedding in Paris and then got sent to Florence. Then I was told, okay. And I was so tired after all that, like had not been asleep because, you know, with the time difference, I was doing VOs and stuff for, and live links back to the US as well as working all day. And then they were like, okay, you're going to do this shoot with Tom. It's three countries in one day. You're leaving tomorrow. And, it, and I'm like, what? <laughs> like, and I sold all my luggage from the Cannes Film Festival. There's this really funny photo of me pushing like all this luggage to Newark airport, like all this Cannes stuff in a ball gown at the end of that, that trip. But we were up for like 48 hours. And that was one of the only times I got really bad jet lag and had to just take a day. Like the whole room by the time that was over was like, moving it was so okay. crazy it was a whirlwind I mean I've done that circuit I've done the Cannes Film Festival the Grand Prix straight after and it's so exhausting and you're on this a whole other schedule you're Darling, on a- it's just <laughs> so tough <laughs> you're running on adrenaline because there's so much glamour around take us into like one of your most memorable moments was it you know just kind of being up there with Tom at Times Square what was one of the most memorable moments for you Oh my gosh. I'll, I'll tell you that that one's a funny one just because it was like shocking for me. So I had was on the mission impossible tour and we'd been to Vienna, we'd been to London, we'd been to New York and no one told me I was hosting this whole live thing. I thought I was just, my interview with him was getting broadcast up on the main screen. And so I get there and I, we just landed and I was all like jet lagged. And I remember it was a really hot day in New York. My hair was frizzy. They'd sent a a groomer instead of a hair makeup artist who's really for men so I just looked like so bad <laughs> I get there and it's like like 20,000 people it's Times Square shut down and Paramount they're like here's the mic just you know warm up the crowd and I'm like what <laughs> like I don't know how to do that like I just have conversations with people it's more intimate like my thing is about creating intimacy so I was like oh my god so that I'll just channel Oprah so I go <laughs> what's up Times square <laughs> and my producer was like oh my god and it was it was so funny um I definitely faked that one till you make it my most memorable though I have to was, was, what sorry to interrupt you did an amazing job I, I just remember you know doing research for this and going okay, let's have a look at this. And I saw you and I was like, wow, this girl is amazing. Because I know when I started my career, I was getting so nervous at the point, like at some point I was like, okay, I, I can just cancel this job. I just won't do it because it's just gonna be too stressful. Um, but I know what you mean. I've been thrown into a live situation as well. And you get up there and you're like, Ugh. and at first, you know, the first five seconds, I was like stuttering almost. And then you kind of relax into it. Yeah, for sure. A live audience is a whole other thing. I've hosted a lot of live but it's just camera. So I've hosted the live Oscar telecast with Chris Harrison for TV Guide Network. I've hosted all the Dick Clark for American Music Awards. They don't bother me, it, but it was when you have to talk to people, as a, that's a whole other piece of artistry and it requires a high energy. And I don't think I necessarily host at a super high energy. I think it's more about, I just try and make it feel like you're watching a conversation or we're being silly or create intimacy. 
so yeah it was Jackie I mean it was a whole other it was a whole other thing like I was traumatized but <laughs> it went well thank god I, I I think it was one of those times where I literally thought the floor could just open up and swallow me like that would be so nice for that <laughs> I mean, when Tom came up because he's so charismatic he can talk like a politician so I remember when he came up, I just handed him the mic. I was like, you go, you go. And he was amazing. And he essentially co-hosted it with me because he was so, he's so incredible and very good at that. Yes. Um, and I actually learned and watched how he did it <laughs> for like the next time because he was so good at it. I love that. That's awesome. And, and it must be one of your most memorable moments today because I mean, when you're faced with like that sort of challenge, you're just like, wow. And you must have been running on adrenaline afterwards. How do you keep reinventing yourself and staying current? That was one of the questions we had from a young um, lister. She said, I want to know how Carly stays relevant and so energetic because you seem so full of energy and so full of life. And I love that you put yourself in character and you've painted your face and you just kind of go out there and you make it so fun. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Actually, that's a good one. For, for Daniel Craig, you know, it was when he did the Bond tour and – what we were all hearing, I was supposed to host the, the premiere in London, the world premiere. And then I had another show I created and my co-host and I had an appearance on Wendy Williams. So we didn't get to go. So I ended up hosting the one in Mexico City. And we we're all hearing, all the, the hosts are hearing Daniel, you know, a bit grumpy. He's saying he doesn't want to do James Bond again. He's saying, you know, like not into it. So I'm like, oh God, like, what are we going to do? Because everyone wants, you know, that's the interview. And I'm not going to have to host with them live in a premiere. So this can't be like a dud. That's mass humiliation. So I had to cover Mariah was doing a Halloween party. And she was like, Carly, I literally was on my way to the airport. And she's like, trying to, you know, come bring a crew, cover it. So they pushed my flight to a red eye. And a red eye to Mexico City from LA is only three hours. So I got on the flight at 12 midnight land at like 3 a.m. No sleep at all. Get to the hotel. The makeup artist comes in because the interviews were started at like 8 a.m. And she, we're, I was talking to her and she was like, yeah, I did the makeup on the movie. I did the Day of the Dead sequence, I'm thinking. And it was Dia de Muertes. It was the Day of the Dead. I'm thinking, why conceal what you can just did? <laughs> Day of the Dead was what I was looking like. So I thought, all right, let's just go for this. I was like, can you do that makeup on me? And she's like, yeah, let me just call my person. I'll get the beads and all this stuff, like gluing it on. And I thought, and this is good because Daniel, it will be unexpected. And he'll, and it also honors the film. So, you know, it looks like we put in some effort. So maybe we'll get a bit of a reaction out of him. So I go in and they have like, you know, <laughs> to James Bond looking like shocking. And he like loved it and it works. Thank God. Sometimes it does. Sometimes it doesn't. You have to you, no risk, no reward. You have to be prepared to fall on your face and be embarrassed for sure. I think you just can't show fear either. Like interviewing people like Robert De Niro, Bob, um, <laughs> if, if he sniffs fear on you, you're destroyed in that interview. You have to be like now, but if he gets a little like touchy, you have to be like now, Bob, you naughty thing. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and that's what I learned, like the sort of more, more intimidating ones, the less you have to show fear and the sillier you should be. Not stupid. There's a difference. Not yeah. just silly, just not irreverent. Playful and fun and just like, you know, but you have that personality. I think that's why you, you know, you continue to stay relevant. And that's why I think your career has just completely continued to flourish. Uh, thank you. I, you know, I find people interesting. I, I always know when I'm interviewing, it's not really about me. And so in terms of relevance, I, I appreciate that, that word. I think it's about the interview and making them relevant. If, if, if the interview is broken out everywhere, people are talking about it, then I guess you're relevant. <laughs> so exactly maybe, right. maybe that's the, that's the way it's just always being very interested in your, in your subject matter and bringing out the best in them and something that will interest other people in them. Absolutely. You know, what advice do you have for young women who are pursuing a career, maybe a career in TV, or it could be just any other career. What advice do you have? Um, Definitely never give up. Be, be realistic. But if it's something that you really believe in your heart of hearts, you can do work so hard. Really, you have to work harder than anyone else. I definitely did. Um, 
I, it didn't come easily to me. It wasn't an easy ride. It was not a meteoric rise. And yeah, just don't give up. I think a lot of the time I was so close to giving up and looking back, I'm like, oh my God, like I was so close. And, and just to keep going and, and really believe in yourself and just work really hard. Honestly, if you do just work so hard, it will pay off. But you just have to be prepared that for 99% sometimes of your effort, it will only be a 1% that will sort of take you to that next step. So you have to be okay with a lot of rejection and not let that affect your mental health and, you know, sense of self. And it does, it absolutely does, but it's like how you deal with that and just keep going and keep moving forward. Just keep overcoming it and keep challenging yourself. And, and that's why I love this topic this year for International Women's Day is we have to choose to challenge ourselves because if we don't, I mean, the alternative is we we stay complacent and there's no future in that. That just, you know, that's when I think a lot of women tend to kind of go on the other side and put some weight on because we tend to get depressed. I know with myself. That's me. I'm an emotional anger. I'll be <laughs> in the 10 times. <laughs> Tim Tams are amazing. I'm going to have to bring you some when I come over to LA. I love those Tim Tams. <laughs> <laughs> now let's get back to talking about your personal life. How was it when you met Jacob? Was it love at first sight? You know, people hear about, you know, he, I just knew he was the one or often guys tend to say, I knew she was the one. How was it for the two of you? It, it actually, you know, again, a lot of the cliches you hear, it actually was that. And, and for me, I think working with so many people, knowing so many people, meeting so many people, I'm go on instinct always with everything, just go on instinct. And so with guys, it's always been that, like, I know right away if I like them or not. And, and I got chastised over that, like, give them a chance and maybe it's a grower. And for some people it is, I've seen that it's just from my personality type and just being so instinctive and intuitive, it was always an immediate thing. Having said that, I've had instincts about people and then I got cheated on. So it doesn't always work out. But I do know if I like them or not from the beginning, from the first. They put yourself out there. They just weren't the right yeah. one. That's why they cheated. They were making way for Jacob to come through. Where did yeah, you guys- I'm continuing to cheat on everybody. Some are just cheaters, girls. Don't yeah. blame yourselves. Like some just are. And I see guys and they're with unbelievable women and some are just, some just cheat and some women cheat. You know, it's, it goes both ways. Um, but yeah, with Jacob, I was in Aspen, very, you know, fancy ski resort in the US. And I was with Rebel, we were on a girls trip, it was girls New Year's. And we were just excited to be with our friends. We had a really fun group. A lot of people we knew were there. And we were at this restaurant, um, we'd skied up to the top of this mountain, um, this restaurant called Cloud Nine. And it's actually the world's biggest seller of Veuve Clicquot champagne, even though it's only open for like four hours a day, seasonally because it's it's a spraying menu. So you order the champagne and then they all like spray it around the room. So one of the guys on our table had ordered the gun, the champagne gun. So Rebel and I got like the champagne gun and we saw this, I saw this table of guys next to us and one was super cute and he caught my attention because he, not only because he's six, seven, <laughs> but also and handsome, but um, he reminded me of someone I knew. So I sort of look, I was looking at him, looking at him, and then I realized it wasn't the guy, but I liked him. I was like, well, that guy's really cute. He'd be a great New Year's Day. So I get the gun, Rebel and I, and then we spray their table. And then they retaliate and spray us. And then I took my friend Ashley over and I went to like apologize, even though I wasn't sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, hey. And, and we started talking. It was so loud in there. It was, it's like um, a, club, a club during the day in a ski resort. And people are just getting crazy. It's so fun. Champagne spraying around. Wild. Um, and I don't think he heard anything I said, but he said he just liked me. And so he asked for my number, texted me really fast. And then that night, his, their table was right next to ours at the nightclub there, Bootsy Bellows. And then the next day, their table was next to ours at this other place, Chair 9. And, and then we had our first date on New Year's Eve. Um, we went, all went snowmobiling, Rebel 2 and, and all his guy friends. And then we spent, we had our, you know, kiss at the New Year's Eve party. And then that was it. I love that. So wait, Jacob is 5'7"? I mean, Six, seven. wow, that's amazing. And you're 5'7", so I like yeah, that. Yeah, I'm 5'8", five, I'm five, so I feel like I look small compared to him, which is nice, because I'm used to, you know, a lot of actors are not that tall. And so on camera, you can look bigger than them. So I'm always like, 
I'm just so small. <laughs> I love that. Carly, I want to now play a little game with you. It's called Quick Five Closing Questions, and then we're going to talk about just a couple of other things. Question number one, you have five seconds to answer these, so you can't think about it, okay? Favorite okay. Here. Tom Cruise. All right. Greatest moment on TV? Greatest? Yes. Greatest probably Met Gala when Celine Dion serenaded me in the whole carpet, came to stop. It's on my Instagram. It was epic. <laughs> Biggest TV blunder? Um, when I was interviewed for a movie and I said I shot in the hills of Beverly, which sounded very airheady and shows I'm better at interviewing than being interviewed. I thought you pulled that off quite well because if your background is being Scottish, it was very elegant in my opinion, but okay, we'll go with that one. <laughs> my dad doesn't think so. <laughs> <laughs> Dads are always quite critical. Question number four, have you and Jacob thought about kids? And if so, how many? Yes, and we're gonna just start with one because I'm an only child. No, definitely no more than two, but right now we're at the one. Smart, I always say, you know what? Start with one and see how you go. Question number five, how old were you when you had your first kiss? Oh my gosh. Oh, 13. I 13. love that. I love yeah, that. It. It, was ice skating rink. it was in an ice skating rink and it was really, it felt like a washing machine. It was really bad. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to the guy that I just said that. <laughs> I know. I remember thinking, oh my gosh, what's going on? He's sticking his tongue in my mouth. Is this right? There's a yeah. lot going on. There's a lot going on. <laughs> I didn't do it again for a while. I think it was put off for like three years. I'm not kidding. Trauma. Traumatized for sure. I was as well. Now you've done some amazing stuff um, with Snapchat recently. Um, tell us about that because um, I want to get into it. I, I love, I know it's got to do with dancing. Um, tell us a little bit more about that. Yes. Um, Rebel and I did this funny video before Cats came out where we did cat exercise and we, with my dance cardio instructor, we all dressed up as cats. Even my husband did it and danced to like the Jellicle song. And it was a great way of tr tricking yourself into working out. So during the pandemic, um, Gina Matthews and I created this show for Snapchat called Move It. It teaches just 10 second little routines, just steps, easy kind of TikTok moves um, to awesome songs. Like really, we got sick music. But when you dance and you record yourself in the lens, um, when you go like this, like wings can come out of your hand or you've got different effects triggered by your dance moves or like you can shoot flames or lightning and all kinds of really cool stuff. So it looks like you're starring in your own music video um, and these effects are applied in real time. So you're not having to spend a lot on like after effects and it makes everyone look like they're a great dancer. So definitely check it out, move it on Snapchat. Move it on Snapchat. I'm going to check it out and do something with my daughter and we'll send it across to you for sure. I love that because when you do little dance moves and they're so in right now on TikTok, my daughter's got addicted to it. I've had to delete the app because she would just spend so much time on it and she'd sneak around trying to steal my phone just so she could do it. Um, <laughs> and all celebrities have got into it. I think that's, that's fantastic that you've done that. How brilliant. Carly, you're brilliant. What's a project that you've got coming up that you want to put out there? You don't have to tell us too much because I know, you know, in Hollywood, it's all hush hush until it happens. Well, it's definitely my scripted, you know, I'm working on a couple of different projects at the moment. I'm writing a movie that actually I was working on developing with, with Rebel, and, which is with one of the major um, comedic production companies. And right now we're sort of, developing that at the moment about my like life and entertainment tonight but it's a dark comedy and that's definitely the next thing I'm excited about is like being in and writing like and creating scripted shows not just um unscripted I love that and will you star in it as well or will you be behind yes. the scenes? yes I've got a role I didn't make myself the main character but I definitely like my role I mean she's not so dissimilar from who I am so it's not exactly a stretch <laughs> but it's I love that I love that you're so creative um you are just the epitome of you know this classically beautiful tv presenter who's just got it all and it's such a pleasure to have you on oh uh, thank you so much this is awesome thanks Carly lots of love lots of love